sweet promise is given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, my own to receive. Welcome to Bible Talk Class. We are happy that you can join us today. And we hope that you invite your friends, families, and church members to join you so that all of you can be part of this community where we discuss, we talk, we dissect the Bible so that we get the proper understanding of biblical issues that should guide us as we prepare for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. As we kickstart our presentation on this platform, we have chosen to present today a very interesting topic that we know you are interested. We have captioned it, Yeshua Mashiach, or Jesus Christ. Many have asked the question as to whether the Son of God or Son of Man, born 2,000 years ago, was called Jesus Christ or Yeshua Mashiach. And so in this presentation, we want to take you through scripture. Let's get started. And as we start and as we journey together, take your Bibles and read the references that we have put together, supporting each biblical statement that we make so that it can grow together as a church, family, friends, in the Lord. As we wait for the soon coming of Jesus Christ, let's get the right teachings that will put us on the right path. Welcome once again. As we already mentioned, our topic is Yeshua Mashiach or Jesus Christ. We'll be guided by the following outline. Language and inspiration, name of the creator being the son of God and the son of man, discipleship. Let's begin. Language and inspiration, what is it? Inspiration is a process God used to communicate his message through his written word. Language here refers to the medium through which human beings documented God's message and that, as far as we know, only human language spoken by people of a particular historical heritage is used for this documentation. And you see kind of references um, are here to verify. God created Adam and Eve with the ability to communicate with each other with a language and this is evident in Genesis chapters 2 to 3. After the fall, God authored diverse languages to spread humanity on the face of the earth. We can read um, from Genesis chapter 11 to confirm that indeed God is the author of human language or languages. Language and inspiration, in short, is synonymous to divinity in human contests. Language and inspiration, again, but here we are focusing on the word, the written word. The words, deeds, and experience of God were documented in human language. And as far as we know, the Old Testament was written largely in the Hebrew, and some portions of the Old Testament written in Aramaic language. So these are the references also to confirm. Hebrew and Aramaic languages belong to the Semitic family of languages. They share similar words. They share similar alphabets and they are very close. They belong to the same family of languages. The Jews were the first to translate the Old Testament into Greek language for Jewish community outside Palestine from 3rd century BC. And this translation is 
usually called the Septuagint because it is believed that 70 or 72 people translated the Old Testament and all their translations, even though they translated um, individually, their translations were correct and same. And so we called the Greek version of the Old Testament translated by the Jews in the third century Septuagint or LXX. The Jews were the first again to translate the Old Testament into Aramaic for Jews in Palestine after the exile who could not speak the Hebrew. So after they returned from exile uh, to Palestine, they couldn't speak the Hebrew language. And because of the influence of the Assyrians or the Babylonians um, and their uh, exilic experience, they forgot their Hebrew language and started using the Aramaic, which was a sister language of the Hebrew. Jesus and the disciples preached to their Jewish audience in Palestine in Aramaic. So Aramaic was used by Jesus and disciples when they interacted with the Jewish people. The, the, the episode that we have in um, the final days of Jesus is interesting to note. Jesus' last prayer on the cross was in Aramaic. And we read, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And so Jesus spoke Aramaic, not Hebrew. The superscription, this is the king of the Jews, on the cross was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And when you read the word Hebrew, the author meant Aramaic, because in the first century, the Jews spoke Aramaic. And because Aramaic and Hebrew were sister languages, or they belong to the same family of languages. When you say Hebrew, it meant Aramaic in the first century. The Pentecost experience signaled the supernatural approval of the global character of the plan of salvation. This point means that during the Pentecost, God occasioned a situation that people of different backgrounds could hear their language spoken by the disciples of Jesus. This means that the gospel was to be preached in all languages, that the gospel was not to be preserved in Aramaic, the language of the disciples. It was to be, it was to be um, preached in all languages. That's the point. Paul and the other apostles spoke in Aramaic to the Jews in Palestine. When Paul met the Jews, the leadership, he spoke in Aramaic. The text says Hebrew. And as I've already explained, when they say Hebrew, they mean um, Aramaic. The four gospel authors told the story about Jesus and his ministry in Greek because they were writing to non-Jewish community or non-Aramaic or Hebrew speakers. Only Luke was a non-Jew. The rest were Jewish by birth and they knew how to speak Aramaic, yet they wrote in Greek. Mark, in particular, when writing to a Roman audience, transliterated many words into Latin. So it tells you that the gospel was to be preached in all uh, languages. Paul spoke and wrote in Greek to Jewish and non-Jewish outside Palestine. When Paul was ministering to the Jews, he spoke Aramaic. But when he was um, ministering to the non-Jews 
or even Jews outside Palestine. As we see from his writings or letters, he wrote, spoke in Greek. The New Testament authors engage in transliteration and translation of certain terminologies of the Hebrew. They could not render in Greek. And so you see the use of language in spreading the gospel. That's why we call this uh, uh, section language and inspiration, the word. These authors, we mean the New Testament authors in particular, knew the dynamics in translation and contextualization. That as you bring the gospel to the world, you must also speak their language. The missionary character of God's word dictates transmission of the message into all languages. The commission is go to the world, Matthew 28. And we see in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, and Revelation caps it all that the three angels' message has to be preached to all human beings on the face of the earth, speaking different languages. And so the gospel has to be preached. Now let's look at the name of the creator being. What was the name of the creator being? According to scripture, in biblical times, names were used to describe events. There are two categories of biblical names. We have personal names and qualifying names. Personal names of God as follows. Elohim, God, that's a Hebrew. Eloah, God. El, also God. Adon, Adonai, Lord. In the Greek is Kurios. And then we have YHWH, the Jewish uh, authors um, and scholars have made it clear that you don't pronounce this word because this word is sacred. It's a sacred name of, of, of God. And therefore, it was replaced with Adonai. We have Sur, means rock. We have Kadush, holy one. We have Shaddai, almighty. We have Theos, that's a Greek, for El. We have the qualifying names, and the qualifying names are names that tell something about God. Abhir, mighty one. El Elohe, Israel, the God of Israel. Elion, Most High, Gibor, Mighty One, El Roi, the God who sees, Sadiq, Righteous, Kana, Jealous, Sebaoth, Lord of Hosts, Patir, Father, Abba, Father. So we have these words used in describing the creator being he has different names different qualifying names and these words are used to describe the work the being and the relationship of this creator being to his um, people so they're more functional more functional you can see that there are several ways that um the, the Jews and the, the New Testament authors and believers address him. One interesting thing I want us to note is that in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, the Exodus experience formally introduces the name Adonai. The name Adonai. God said that he told Moses that I did not introduce myself to the patriarchs as Y H W H Adonai. But now I'm introducing myself with this name because I'm going to deliver Israel. And I want Israel to remember this incident, this event. And so this name is a name that anytime it's mentioned, it reminds the Jewish people of their deliverance from Egypt. It's a personal and experiential name. 
In the New Testament, we read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, God is introduced as Abba. Here it is Aramaic. The Hebrew is Ab. The Aramaic is Abba. Simply means Father. And God is introduced as Abba, Father, as a familial name. Family. Family. So for believers in the New Testament, God is identified or is described as Father, part of us, family, uniting with our Father. That's a distinction. It's a different experience from what we have in Exodus chapter 6. So the name of God basically is functional. We look at the Son of God or the Son of Man, views on origin and meaning of his name. What was his name? The Son of God, Son of Man is named Jesus in the English, but some think that the name means Hail Zeus. The implication is that Jesus is a fake person based on Zeus, the God of the Greeks. Response is that the Greek word Hail does not mean Hail. Rather, the Greek word Thyre means hail. So it is not Thyre Zeus, it's Hail Zeus. So when you say that Hail Zeus actually is the original form from which Jesus, the name Jesus derived, then we are missing the point. The English Zeus is a short form of the Greek Zeus Pater, meaning Sky Father. The same form is found in Latin, Jupiter, Sanskrit, Jupiter, Old English, Tu, the God after whom our day of the week, Tuesday, is named. So you can see if there is any correlation, you can judge. The Son of God, the Son of Man, is named Christ in English, but some think that the name means Krishna. The implication again is that Christ is a fake person based on Krishna, the Hindu God. The point is that some feel that the name Christ um, is a manufactured name. It's not really a name for a real person. It's like some people manufactured a name just to um, deceive many people. That has been the understanding and teaching. Now, the name Krishna, on the other hand, is a rendering of the Sanskrit name, that's the old Indian language, Krishna, which is derived from the Proto Indo European root, Krishnos, meaning black, dark, or dark blue. The word Christ in English. It derived from the Greek word Christos, meaning one who has been anointed with fire. This word is derived from the Greek verb krio, meaning to anoint with oil. So there's no relationship between Krishna and Christos because Christos, or let's say Christ, is from the Greek word Christos. And we'll look at the etymology later on. But put everything together, the Son of God, Son of Man, is named Jesus Christ in English. And some trace the names to the Hebrew, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yeshu, Mashiach. The response is that the names Yehoshua, Yeshua, were used when the Son of God or Son of Man was ministering in Judea, the first century AD. This is a historical fact because Jesus was born in the first century in Palestine, and in Palestine, the language spoken predominantly was Aramaic. The Aramaic and Hebrew were sister languages, and the sound that you have in, a, in Hebrew is the same sound you have in Aramaic. So in Hebrew is Yeshua, in Aramaic, Yeshua. Yeshu was later used in Talmud, to smear the Son of God, Son of Man, as a sign of divine disapproval because of the tension 
between the early and medieval Christians and the Jews. And so that is the um, understanding that the Jews dropped the ah, Yeshua, removed the ah, and you know, let it sound Yeshua, meaning that he is not really Yeshua, Yahweh saves. We are looking at translation and transliteration theories. Why? We need to have this understanding so that we can be guided well to appreciate how we arrive at the name Jesus or Jesus. Now, translation gives meaning of a foreign word into one's local language by either translating the sense of the word. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, there is a word there that reads dragon. Dragon. Now, dragon in English or uh, in Greek, dracon, um, in a, my local dialect, local language, because my cultural setting uh, or, be, or beliefs um, do not have this concept of dragon the translation was done in my local dialect in a way that does not capture the word it captures only the sense of the word so translate the sense of the word we are giving the meaning of the word and so you don't see the word dragon in my Ghanaian uh, you know uh, uh, tests it's a different word that is used but the word that is used sort of captures another word in verse 15 which is serpent or snake and so you see that the translator had to find another word to capture the word dragon in my dialect in English dragon if the english people have the concept dragon then their readers could easily identify uh you know the the dragon that the test is referring to or you translate the word for word to get a meaning so when you read mark chapter 7 verse 1 the word the greek word there shows that the author was referring to a group of people that the English translates as scribes, as scribes. The word is just word for word translation. But when it says scribes, in my local dialect, the way it has been translated suggests that these scribes were writers. But if you go behind this word, scribes, okay, you see that it was more than writing. But the translators translated in English as scribes, as is in the Greek. So it's word for word translation. Now, transliteration gives the same word in one's language as a foreign word is, either by sound. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, you read in the Greek is titos. Now the Latin is titus. Titus. Now the English translators have Englishized Titus, uh, more or less the Latin, which is Titus, and have made the same spelling as Titus. Titus. And then in, my, in my language, it's different. It's Tito. Tito. We will come there later. But you can see that the, the translators did transliteration and just did that with the sound. And um, the, 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 the one transli transliterating can also transliterate um, by words. So, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, the word Satan in the, in the Greek is Satanas. In English, Satan. In my language, Satan. So, you can see that translators um, could not find any other word to capture the word Satan. The concept 
may not be in their cultural beliefs or understanding and therefore they just repeated the exact words you know as found in the original text let's look at the etymology of his name and title the name given to the son of god who was born the first century was pronounced as Yeshua because Aramaic was the language of his birthplace. So we are looking at the name first. Later we'll look at the title. In the first century, we see that the Jews translated the Hebrew uh, texts into the Greek. And they did that for the Jews living in Egypt who could only speak the Greek language. The LXX transliterated Yeshua as Jesus because the Greek-speaking Jews did not have the same name in the Greek language. Therefore, the Jews transliterated Yeshua by the sound. Note that the Greek does not have letters Y and SH. That is why they are replaced with I and S respectfully. The idea is that because the Greek alphabet does not have Y letter, does not have one letter that when you pronounce you get a sound SH, then they have to replace these letters in Yeshua with uh, I and S. And because Yeshua is a name of a person, it's a noun. And in Greek, nouns are classified according to gender. And because it's a name of a man in particular, then Yeshua, when converted or transliterated into the Greek, it becomes masculine noun. And every noun, Usually, I will say, a caution here, usually, and let's say all the, the, I mean, masculine nouns, usually, and in S, S. So the word will have S at the end to show that this is a masculine noun. Hence, Jesus, Jesus. So now we understand how we got here, how the Greek transliterated the word Yeshua. The Jewish writers such as Philo and Josephus use the Greek Jesus for the people living out, living inside and outside Palestine. Among the 72 translators of the Alexis, according to the epistle of Aristias, three bore the name Jesus. We find twice Yehoshua or Yeshua translated as Yeson. Just you know, a few places that we find um, this rendering. But Jesus was a common name used up to the early second century. So in many Jewish uh, writings, uh, the name Yeshua was translated as Jesus. The anti uses Jesus for Joshua in Acts chapter 7 verse uh, 45 and Hebrews uh, chapter 4 verse 8. And when you read the old Latin, that is Virtus Latina, and the Latin Vulgate, that's the old Latin Bible, we see that the Greek word Jesus is translated as Jesus, Jesus. Now, the word you see here is Latin and it's um, capital, you know, it, it comprises um, capital letters of the Latin um, alphabet. Um, what you see here is important because we need to explain this for us to appreciate the change and the sound. In Latin, the I, as you see here, the capital I, when it's used at the beginning of a word, 
it has a consonantal sound like G. when it's used in the middle of the word it has the vowel sound as a a a that's the i now the v this v you see here when it's in the um word at, at, at the end or in the word is a vowel and it begins also it has that consonantal uh, uh sound and so in in ad 800 when small letters or lowercase of the latin alphabet um were introduced the name as we see here was translated more or less um, uh, converted into um, jesus why because the i because it's beginning a word and that word is a name of a person then the i is pronounced as a consonant so it's g and then you have the u the v also uh, was rendered as a vowel so u now you see that the roman language or latin name of a person is usually pronounced though we have some some that i think we are familiar with like titus or titus okay or situnus tacitus so you can see us 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 so jesus jesus so the latin rendering of the greek jesus is jesus jesus now the 16 11 king james bible refers to jesus as jesus and his father the earthly father as yosef yosef the english translators later on rendered the latin vocate because they translated from the latin at the beginning and they rendered the latin vocate jesus as jesus jesus so more or less they retained the latin rendering it's just like um uh, titus the greek is titus and the latin um the roman you know um rendering or uh, pronunciation of the word titus the greek say titus the romans will say uh, 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 titus titus or titus the english will say titus the Romans will say Titus, Titus. And so the same form is retained in the English. That's why we have the word Jesus. The Ghanaian Bible translators rendered the uh, English Jesus as Yesu because in the Ghanaian language, the alphabet we have, we do not have a letter J. We don't have the J sound, don't have any letter that says J. Of course, we have some words we put together that can give you the J sound, but it's too hard. J is a bit soft, soft. And so um, the, 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 the Ghanaian Bible translators have to rely on the, 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 the Greek sound and uh, possibly uh, the, the, the Hebrew, you know, to, to express the Y sound, the, the Y sound. The Y sound, UI sound. So, Yesu, Yesu. That's why we have Yesu. Now, we look at the title. The name, or it's the title, or the Son of God, was pronounced Mashiach. This person called Yeshua, or Jesus, or Jesus, or Yesu was given the title Mashiach because Aramaic was the language of his birthplace. Mashiach comes from the Hebrew verb Mashiach to anoint with oil. The LXX translated Mashiach into the equivalent Greek word Krio and Mashiach as Christos. So the LXX translators, the Greek translators, found a Greek word 
that conveys the same meaning of Mashiach. Mashiach. And that word is Christos. We have other Jewish um, writings also translating Mashiach as Christos. Even in the first century, secular Roman historians transliterated Christos as Christus. Christus, because to render a name in Latin, Latin, particularly human being, the ending, as you can see, us, us, like Jesus, Tacitus, Titus, Christus. So the secular Roman historians transliterated Christus, that's a Greek, as Christus in Latin. The English transliterated the Latin Christus as Christ. Here, the English departed from the Latin and shortened the name by saying Christ, Christ for the English uh, reader to appreciate. The Ghanaian language transliterated from the English to Christo, Christo, because in the Ghanaian language, we do not have... Um, uh, C, number one, and we don't have CH to give us a sound that you, you, you produce from your throat. Okay? We call it gathra. When you produce a sound from your throat, gathra. Because we don't have CH in Ghanaian alphabet. Okay? CH. We don't have together to produce a sound from the throat. And the nearest letter that can convey the sound, the sound, CH sound. <laughs> then we, um, the translated had to translators had to use K or K, 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 and Christo, Christo, Christo. So here, the Ghanaian language transliterated, okay. But the Greek, let's say the New Testament authors, they translated. The meaning they, they 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 gave meaning to Mashiach, and the meaning was Christos, but Latin did transliteration, English transliteration, Ghanaian language transliteration by sound by sound. Let's finalize this discussion. We come back to language and inspiration, the word. The family of Jesus, including James and Jude, called the Son of God their brother. According to the New Testament, James and Jude were the brothers of Yeshua. So they called their brother, who was the Son of God, in Aramaic, Yeshua. But when they were writing to non Aramaic speakers, they use the word Jesus. The LXS, the New Testament authors, who were predominantly Jews, with the exception of Luke, rendered the Hebrew Yeshua in the Greek Jesus, following the sound of the Hebrew, the sound of the Hebrew. They did not change the meaning, only the sound of the Hebrew. The LXX and the New Testament authors rendered the Hebrew Mashiach into the Greek Christos, following the meaning or the semantic value of the Hebrew, following the meaning of the Hebrew. Mashiach means the anointed one. Christos means the anointed one. Though Hebrew Yeshua and Mashiach were translated in the Greek as Jesus Christos. The same person identified with the Hebrew name was intended with the Greek. No changes. The same person was intended with the names. The question we should ask is who was and what was his mission? He is to save his people from sin. He is described as God, 
He forgives sin. He accepted worship. He claims equality with the Father. He claims to give rest to human beings. He claims to be blasphemed. He is the Son of God. He claims to be everywhere. What should be our attitude after this lesson? The Son of God, the Son of Man, commissioned his disciples, one, to make disciples. Tell people about him, about what he did. After that, baptize said people. Baptize them and teach them. Teach them to know the ways of this Son of God or Son of Man and why he came. Disciples should remember his ever-abiding presence, that he is always with us. These are important images we find in the New Testament. Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Yesu Christo. All these names in different languages refer to the same person who came to die for us. And therefore, we should let people know about what he has done for us as individuals. He said that when you declare my name, when you proclaim my name, I myself will draw many unto myself. Emphasis supplied. Believers, it is time to learn the right teachings about Jesus, about Yeshua, about Jesus, about Yesu. The name will not change anything. The difference is, do I know him personally as my savior? And am I happy to tell people about him and what he came to do? Am I willing, ready, to tell people that he is coming very soon and that I, we should prepare for him? This is a challenge. Today, I trust that you have understood that it doesn't matter which language with which you pronounce the name of the Son of God. What matters most is that he is in your heart, he is in my heart, and that people can see that we are the salt of the world, we are the light of the world, and that when you are looking for him, when they see us, they can see him. Thank you very much for joining. If you love this presentation, share with your friends, family, church, and the world. Subscribe to this channel. Be a member of Bible Talk class. And you always receive wonderful presentation such as this. God bless you. And keep the faith alive. Bye-bye. The glorious appearing of Jesus our Lord Of promises all it stands as the sun Behold I come quickly Hold fast till I